Hi, uh, I'm Ed Jaffe and welcome to JaffeWoodwinds.com. Uh, today we're going to have our sixth installment in the Woodwind Legacy series and we have not one but two guests, uh, two uh, old friends of mine and colleagues who have been uh, very important in the New York Woodwind world over the last 30 plus years. Uh, both Dan Willis and Rick Heckman are noted uh, not only as uh, wonderful multi-instrumentalists on all the saxophones, clarinets and flutes, uh, but with sets them apart additionally is their expertise on oboe and English horn and today we're going to delve into uh, the world of the contemporary uh, woodwind doubler geared to the oboe. Uh, so welcome Dan and Rick thanks for joining me Thank today you. and thanks. Uh, coming by to do this. Uh, I want to just start the interview uh, with a little bit of background of both of you. Both of you came from other towns in, to New York. Uh, Dan you came from Fredonia and Rick from Pittsburgh. Uh, and came here to work, uh, study and work, and have been fixtures on the scene now for, like I mentioned, over 30 years. So uh, just give us a little bit of background on how you got into music and what were your first uh, woodwind instruments. Uh, so we'll, we'll start with Dan and then go to Rick. Um, well, I come from a musical family. My uh, grandparents were both musicians, uh, violin, piano, both taught and uh, ran their own uh, music store, Willisinski Music in Niagara Falls. And so from an early age, uh, we were allowed to run around the music store and off hours and beat on the instruments. And um, so there was always music in our family and, and teachers. And um, so I began studying piano at an early age, uh, tried drums for a little bit. And then uh, at around age 12, um, my father asked me if I'd be interested in playing the saxophone. I said, yeah, sure. He goes, great, you're going to start on the oboe. <laughs> I thought, great, that's wonderful. Because at that time, my association with the oboe was primarily seeing Bugs Bunny do snake charmer stuff in the cartoons. So as soon as I got an oboe, I fell in love with it, loved the sound of it, all the different colors that you could make with it. And then uh, it was about two weeks later, I got handed a saxophone. And I thought that was really a, a wonderful situation because I got to play oboe in the orchestra and then saxophone in the band. And... Um, and then when my father would take me uh, on gigs, he was a professional musician, I would see uh, the saxophone players playing multiple instruments. And in my mind, I thought they were the luckiest people in the band because they got to play the flute, they got to play the clarinet, and I thought, and, you know, soprano saxophone as well. I thought, this is really what I want to do. I just fell in love with the wood woodwind instruments and wanted to uh, slowly study each one individually. <clears throat> That's an interesting uh, beginning. Most people uh, at least spend one year on one instrument. You had a, you had a full two weeks <laughs> I was, yeah, before right you got to there. be a doubler. Yeah. <laughs> and how old were you at that time again? No, I was age 12. Well, yeah. so sixth grade, basically. Yeah. Well, actually, I'm sorry, fifth grade. Fifth grade. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Wow. Uh, that's, that's a different theme. We're going to get back to that. Rick, what, what about your scene? Uh, I was not from a musical family in any way, but somehow I was always drawn to instruments. I would, we'd be sitting at dinner, I would be playing drums with my knife and fork, or we'd go to somebody's house and they'd have an, an organ, and I would sit down and just start fooling around with it. You just couldn't get me away from them. I was just so fascinated. And I remember being in a toy store with my father one time, and I saw a toy saxophone. I thought, wow, that's really cool looking, this nice curved shape and everything. So he bought it for me, and I started playing around with it. And when it came time to choose a band instrument when I was in grade school, I chose the saxophone, cause, mostly because I think I, looked, I liked the way it looked. It was just a cool shape and yeah. interesting, and uh, just sort of went from there. Interesting. So uh, now both of you uh, uh, are top flight oboe doublers, and, and Dan, obviously oboe ended up being your first woodwind instrument so uh, you began immediately with that did you get private instruction on that immediately um, for about a year I was studying with uh, our, our band director and um, it became apparent that uh, that my love for the instrument was going past what he could teach me and again because my father uh, was a musician and, and the, the community of musicians knew you need to get to the best teacher that you can and he um, 
he hooked me up with uh, Rodney Pierce of the Buffalo Philharmonic, and so yeah, that was that was sixth grade. So I was pretty lucky to have a great teacher very early on, and you know, start read making and and uh, you know, slowly going through the method books, a little bit of the literature, uh, but we didn't get into too much of that right at first. But um, you know, you'd learn a solo or two for competitions right. and stuff like that. But for the most part, it, it was all studying technique and breathing and articulation and, and just, you know, trying to get it right. Right. So you, you're going through the fundamentals of wind playing, as anyone would on any first instrument. When did your love for saxophone sort of materialize where you, that became uh, as important as the oboe, if, if not more so? Because uh, you're one of the, you know, better um, jazz sax players we have in town here. <laughs> well, it was... Um, Again, I was simultaneously studying both instruments, um, which that was a lot of my mother driving to two different places in Buffalo. And we didn't live in Buffalo. We lived outside of town, so we were in one of the south towns. So it was quite a drive through many snowstorms to get to uh, the north part of Buffalo or <clears throat> really any part of Buffalo during a snowstorm. But um, so it, I don't think there was any one time where the saxophone became more important to me. I, I think I learned different things from each instrument and brought that over to the other instrument. Um, but primarily, as far as saxophone goes, I was studying jazz uh, and my classical studies were on the elbow. Nice. I wasn't studying classical saxophone, although I did have a, a good background uh, with uh, studying with John Sedola, who was an excellent teacher. Um, so yeah, there wasn't any one time where, I mean, there may have been a few times in my teens where I thought, yeah, jazz is maybe a little bit cooler or more expressive, but it, the more you learn about different genres, there's great things about each style of music and different things to take away from them and also things to bring to the other style of music. Right. Yeah, and Rick, you, you began with saxophone. I did. So um, uh, how did oboe enter the picture in? Well, what happened, I, I was kind of a late bloomer. I didn't have some of the advantages that Dan had, probably because I didn't have a musical family. And it wasn't really until I got to college that I got serious about uh, becoming a doubler. And I remember my saxophone teacher saying to me, if you want to be successful, you have to play really good clarinet and flute. And if you can play one of the double reeds, you know, you'll have a big advantage. So I, I looked around, uh, probably my, my sophomore year in college, I looked around and I realized that one of the oboe players was graduating, one was transferring, and there was only going to be one left. And so I went to the head of the woodwind department. I said, I want to play the oboe, and I want a scholarship. And he said, okay. And I walked out of his office with an oboe. And a scholarship? And a scholarship. <laughs> yeah, I saw, I, saw an, I saw an opening, and I right. took it. Right. And this was Duquesne University? This was Duquesne University. Okay. Yes. And uh, then when you eventually moved to New York and you went to Manhattan School of Music for your master's, uh, you were a saxophone major. I was. With Joe Allard. But then you also began studying with Elaine Duvas. I did. Um, I, I was actually, uh, the timing was so perfect. This was the fall of 1980. And uh, Elaine is principal in the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra. And they happened to be on strike that fall. And I, when I called her for a lesson, she said that you know, she could teach me. But when she went back to work, she probably wouldn't be able to anymore because she'd be too busy and that maybe one of her students could you know, help me. And so I ended up getting a few lessons with her, and she saw how hard I was working and how much I was improving. And when she went back to work, she said, you know, I think I can find the time to fit you in. So right. it was, I was very fortunate. Right. And, and so you made use of your uh, conservatory experience in studying more than just your major, in a sense. You, you took it upon yourself uh, to work on oboe in addition to your saxophone studies. Oh, definitely. And uh, and also, uh, if I remember correctly, you'd studied uh, in Pittsburgh with a little bit with Bernie Goldberg on flute. Um, very informally, he would he was uh, on the faculty at Duquesne, and he would right. come into my practice room once in a while and show me something. He was a very nice man, right? And very generous, right? So flute and clarinet sort of filtered into the studies, certainly with Joe, I'm sure you the clarinet. Right, and even, in, even as an undergraduate, I would take my clarinet into my saxophone lessons because my teacher was actually principally a clarinetist I see. at the time. So I always did both. Right. 
Right. And, and Dan, you went to Eastman School of Music and um, uh, studied there. Uh, were you primarily a saxophone major or uh, were you a doubling major there? Or? Uh, no, I was an oboe major. You were an oboe major, yeah. okay. Um, but at that time, there, weren't, uh, there wasn't a jazz undergrad degree at Eastman, so if you wanted to study any jazz, you were studying with the graduates. <clears throat> so I thought it would be fun because um, you have the ability there, at least at the time, to take as many classes as you would like. So I signed up for as many of the graduate jazz classes as I could, you know, history, arranging, improv classes, all those things. And, um, and Richard Kilmer, um, my OBO teacher, said, as long as you take care of your oboe stuff, you know, learn as much about jazz and saxophone as you can, because it's, it's a great school for just about anything that you want to study. And he was also a saxophonist himself, as well as a cellist. So he thought that, you know, doubling is really a great thing. And it, and it teaches you a lot about music and other instruments, obviously. And, right. and Takes you, I think, to a deeper learning of the oboe. Right. So both of you went to conservatories, studied <clears throat> classical music, got involved with commercial music and jazz during those periods of time, and worked. And I think it's important to mention that your oboe studies were with top flight uh, oboists. They just weren't uh, other doublers. Uh, nothing wrong with that, of course, and both of you have taught for a while, but that your initial studies on oboe were top flight oboe players so that you would treat each of your instruments, uh, saxophone, clarinet, flute, and oboe, as separate entities before you combined them in the doubling uh, aspect. And, uh, and you, uh, you were with Richard Kilmer, you were with Elaine Duvas, and I, I found it interesting just over the years in talking that both of you have continued from time to time to take lessons uh, going back you told me you went back to see Richard Kilmer mm -hmm. uh, not yeah. too recently and you've been working with uh, a new person uh, uh, I actually just had one lesson with uh, Nathan Hughes a few months ago he's the other principal of both the Met and uh, I had attended a master class that he gave and I was so impressed with his his teaching abilities and also his beautiful playing and I thought well this would be a guy I could definitely learn something from and I, I sure did yeah, well, I mean, that's great. Here you are, both well-established pros in New York, 30 years of uh, professional experience, hundreds and upon hundreds of recordings and commercial, jazz, and classical, having played with every uh, organization in New York possible, yet you're still studying. And I think that's something that, um, not only for contemporaries of ours, but younger players, to remember that coming out of a conservatory is a wonderful thing, or any music school, but the learning doesn't stop at that point. Uh, it, it continues for your entire professional career, and here are two guys who uh, sort of embody uh, the essence of being a professional woodwind uh, player, uh, playing in multiple situations, yet still trying to improve and still searching uh, for answers and, and willing to put themselves in front of people as students. And I think that's really um, an essential point uh, for all of us, and hopefully uh, for those listeners out there. Um, with regard to oboe doubling, uh, obviously the majority music that I would assume you uh, are uh, uh, in front of that involves oboe or English horn player generally involves uh, a more uh, classical approach to the sound and to the phrasing. However, as doublers, uh, we are responsible for all types of music, whether it be a classical performance, a jazz performance, a commercial music performance, uh, playing rock and roll. So I, uh, my next question is, uh, how do you stay on top of all your instruments and all the different type of musical demands? What, do you, what does your practice uh, sessions look like? How do you discipline yourself and uh, break up your day for practicing when you're not working full time? And, you know, being consumed running from job to job. Um, let's start with Rick this time. Okay. Well, it's a, it's a real juggling act. It's, there aren't enough hours in the day to do everything, so I, I tend to focus on the things that I'm doing at the moment. Um, I always start with flute in the morning. I think if you don't, you get into a lot of bad habits because once you play the oboe, the, the flute chops are um, altered in some way. You, you get a little swelling or whatever. So I like to always start with the flute in the mornings, and I like to try to play the flute every day, even if I'm not using it for anything, because that's the thing to me that goes the fastest. Um, after that, you know, I, I usually go to the oboe, 
and uh, practice a little bit, and I work on reads pretty much every day. Um, the show I'm doing right now is very read intensive. Um, there's a lot of oboe playing, so I tend to go through them very quickly. So that becomes a major part of my day. And then after that, it depends on how much time I have, whether I have time to do anything else or not. And I tend to play enough clarinet and saxophone at the show that I don't need to do a whole lot unless I have something coming up that I need to prepare. Right. So your, your focus and your practicing is really based upon uh, your work schedule and your practicing for uh, those situations. I, I would say, and, and also just maintenance. Right. You know, with the flute, it's, it's usually general maintenance just to make sure that I keep my playing at a certain Right, level. and when we talk about maintenance on any instrument, uh, I assume we're talking about the fundamentals, uh, uh, tone production, uh, technical control with the fingers, uh, embouchure uh, development, articulations, those most basic fundamentals. Exactly. Right. And Dan, how, how are your practice sessions geared? Uh, well, I'd say we're, we're kind of similar in the respect that um, whatever is on my plate for the week really dictates what I'm going to practice or warm up for. Um, <clears throat> like, for instance, this week uh, was kind of an odd week where I, I refer to it as all of my worlds colliding. Um, when there's a week where I'm, I'm playing intensive oboe and I have to do a jazz solo with uh, New York Pops, and uh, they also threw me a clarinet solo, <clears throat> jazz clarinet solo, which uh, for me, I enjoy playing clarinet and I enjoy playing jazz clarinet. I love listening to jazz clarinet, but I'm not terribly comfortable doing it. It's, I'm much more comfortable playing jazz saxophone. But so anyway, with those three different things on my plate this week, um, the flute kind of went to the side uh, and I was playing and warming up and making reads on the oboe, getting that together for a jingle session. So um, knowing that the oboe is going to mess with my flute chops a little bit and to some extent my saxophone chops, I really think about how I'm warming up on the oboe and what kind of read I need for the session and uh, again how that's going to affect my chops. So uh, again I was doing more oboe this week and as soon as I get to the show I'm a little bit worried about where my flute chops are. but Somehow, and I, I believe this is because the oboe really warms up your body uh, in your chest cavity and your, your sinuses to get that intense sound right in this spot. And somehow, you know, although with the oboe and playing the flute, you do get a little fatigued here and maybe a little bit swelling, but the air is right there. So that's one of those cross your fingers moments that works out for you. It doesn't always work out. <laughs> right. But... Um, I, I do believe that the oboe does prepare you um, in terms of just getting the physicality of the instrument together. Um, right. And I, I use the oboe as, as my basis and my you know, jumping off point for doubling. I, I totally agree with that. I, I found that once I started playing the oboe at a higher level, it improved my playing on all of the instruments. And I think it's mostly about the air, mm -hmm. just learning how yeah. to use the yeah. air in a certain way. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, for my own self, uh, in recent years, and this didn't happen until just, I don't know, maybe the last three or four years, maybe five at the most, uh, I'd always play flute first if I had my druthers in the morning for the same reasons you mentioned about the lips swelling when you get to the reed instruments. Uh, but for some reason, in the last several years, if I play clarinet first, uh, my flute playing seems to be better. And, mm -hmm. what's, and what's better about it is um, the air compression. Mm -hmm. uh, the clarinet has more resistance mm -hmm. than the flute and the back pressure and so forth and just having a reed there uh, forces you to uh, use air in a certain way that perhaps sometimes on flute initially in the morning maybe I wouldn't have since the, it's much less resistant. There's no mm -hmm. reed mm -hmm. uh, to deal with. Uh, and maybe the only reason I can do that at this point is after all the year the cumulative hours on the flute, the embouchure is not going to leave you. but. Moving the air is yeah. something that every day has to be addressed. I wouldn't recommend it to a beginning double no, no, to, no. to start, but <clears throat> it's just no, one of those things that you figure out. You know, it's like, why is yeah. this working? Well, it's because your, your body's warmed up and yeah. you're getting the air speed and the direction in the right yeah. spot. That's interesting. Right. Well, that brings to uh, the forefront uh, another question of the crossover benefits of playing uh, all the woodwind instruments. 
Uh, and it also brings the other side of the coin, the, the negative parts. I mean, we've addressed some of those negative parts with the idea of the lips swelling and when you have to play a non-read instrument, it can be uh, detrimental. But the, the benefits of playing multiple instruments, I think, have to be enumerated because uh, certainly uh, the conservatories and the, the higher education institutions have a negative uh, mindset about those who play multiple woodwind instruments. There's yeah. no ifs, ands, or buts. This is not a debatable question. It exists, and we've all lived through this. Uh, but let's try to enumerate some of these cross benefits that playing multiple woodwind instruments can do, besides the fact that it enables you to get jobs that require multiple mm -hmm. woodwind instruments. So, uh, Dan, you want to talk to that? Uh, well, I, I would say probably the biggest thing is uh, understanding the reed because at a very early age with the oboe, you, you're learning to make your own reeds. And those first reeds aren't very good. And you start <laughs> learning immediately, okay, why didn't this work? It was way too thin on the tip or you gouged the back out. And taking that information from the double reeds to the single reeds, and again, this wasn't something right at first I made the connection to. But one day I just I took a clarinet reed and I, I drew the lines of the oboe reed, you know, the tip, and the windows on the back, and I thought, okay, I'm just going to kind of do what I do on the oboe reed to the clarinet reed and see what happens. And it, it worked out quite well. You know, it, it gives a little bit more vibrancy to the sides. It, and again, you're just a little bit more in tune to where to put the knife on the reed and where to go when things aren't working out. Because uh, as we know, single reeds are, they, they need some help. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they need to be conditioned, they need yeah. to be worked on. Yeah. And um, so I, I would say that was probably the first big benefit that I noticed, uh, just understanding how a piece of cane works right. and how a reed knife works. Right. So that, that's a technical benefit that certainly can uh, be very helpful uh, for all the saxophones and the clarinets transferring your oboe facility. Um, what about musical uh, benefits? Rick, can you talk to yeah, that I a little think, bit? Yeah, <clears throat> I think there's a lot of musical benefits. Uh, one is... Um, being able to play different styles of music within classical music. Um, you know, you may not play a lot of Baroque music if you're a clarinetist, obviously. So, you know, you get a lot of crossover of periods of classical music, you know, uh, playing pieces and etudes for each different instrument. Um, there's also different technical demands. So, you know, as, sa as a saxophone player, a lot of times people are very heavy-handed because the keys are heavier and the springs are heavier. When you play the flute, you can't play like that. So you learn learn finger control in a different way than if you were just you know playing saxophone all the time. And and again, we talked about air. You learning how to use your air correctly. And to me, one of the real keys to playing the different instruments is learning specifically what type of air stream each different instrument takes. Because I believe there is a difference between sure. them. Mm -hmm. Even between members of the same family, alto and tenor saxophone, very different kind of air stream. Sure. And also um, playing classical saxophone versus commercial saxophone, very different kind of air stream. So I think it sure. teaches you flexibility of being able to adapt to each instrument. Right. I, I think that's very true, and it's, and it's something that uh, maybe you don't think about when you start playing the instruments initially, because the initial thing, at least the, I, I'm sure I uh, remember feeling that, I'm sure you did as well, just the idea that you can play you know, all these instruments in different families is a, is a sort of an ego boost and a great feeling. Uh, but then when you look to do it on a more artistic level and take it to a higher level, uh, some of these cross benefits and the difficulties inherent uh, come to the forefront. Um, now, uh, sort of using this as a stepping stone to my next question, uh, I've noticed as a non uh, oboe doubler, non bassoon doubler, um, that the oboe doublers, the younger oboe doublers I've seen over the last, let's say, generation uh, coming into New York. Uh, generally are oboe players initially, or stronger oboe players, but maybe some of the other instruments aren't quite there. And the instrument, interestingly enough, that I've seen uh, to be the weakest is the saxophone, which I find um, a little strange because doublers were always associated uh, with saxophone players who also played clarinet, mm -hmm. flute, oboe, and or bassoon. Um, 
So there seems to be a, a, a change in that, and I'm not sure why that has happened, uh, but it certainly does exist. It's not just a few players here or there. I mean, I see this as a trend. And you're nodding your head, so I assume you may absolutely. feel the same no, yeah, way. Absolutely. So uh, what do you attribute that to? And uh, then we have to talk about what the oboe players, oboe doublers, the younger ones who are there, who may be not as strong on saxophone or may be trained in classical saxophone, which whether we like to admit it or not, doesn't have as much relevance to the commercial music world uh, as maybe we're led to believe when we're students at school. So uh, I guess you agree with that concept as far as the, the younger oboe players today. What would you recommend for them uh, in order to get into playing the saxophone in a more commercial way, in a bit of a jazz way, rock and roll? Mm -hmm. where, where can they... Uh, begin. How should they begin developing that aspect? Assuming that they've already developed uh, on what we call concert saxophone uh, fashion, what would you recommend, and how can they go about doing that? Well, uh, I would say first, there's got to be a, a want and a, a love for making that sound. Um, next would be finding some recordings of someone who inspires you. Um, I would say with uh, starting with like beginning jazz, early jazz, moving into more mid 50s, 60s jazz and find a, a, a commercial saxophone sound that you like, whether it be Michael Brecker, David Sanborn, Tom Scott, <clears throat> um, finding a sound that really you connect with and find a way to make that sound. And then generally it's getting the right equipment, uh, which is also a, another big hurdle these days with the prices of uh, vintage saxophones going through the roof and right. and they're harder to find too. Right. Uh, and then obviously matching up the right kind of equipment, uh, mouthpiece, whatever kind of style you're using. Um, I mean, I have a variety of mouthpieces and not that I use this one for this style and this one for this style. There's certain ones that just help facilitate those styles. Uh, but you do need I mean, if you want to, you should be able to play all different styles on the same setup. Um, so it, it's basically learning uh, by listening, learning by playing with somebody, getting with a teacher who you like the sound that they're making and, and you know, has some knowledge uh, and experience in playing those different types of styles. Right. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more with your first, the fir first thing you stated about there has to be an innate love of the music. Even if you were trained, let's say, as a concert saxophonist, if you're going to play saxophone in a commercial world, you have to know about jazz saxophone. You have to really love it. Uh, you have to know, certainly in today's world, you have to know about rock and roll saxophone and the evolution, uh, you know, from the... Uh, R&B players of the 50s, 60s, as you mentioned, more contemporary people into Michael Brecker and Tom Scott and Sanborn, etc. Uh, but you have to really love that music because if you don't, it will, it will show when you play. Uh, people will hear it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and Rick, what are your thoughts about uh, how to guide young oboe players who maybe haven't worked on those other styles of saxophone playing that are the ones that pay the bread? Right. Well, I was, I was going to speak a little bit to what I believe is the cause of the problem. Okay. Um, I think people of our generation and before us um, often came up through the big band era, and that's sort of how they got their start. And then they sort of transitioned into recordings and Broadway, because Broadway is kind of you know, where it's at right now as far as doubling in New York anyway. And so they had a different kind of background, and they were conversant with a lot of styles of music because of what was required in the recording studios right. and in the big bands. And I think a lot of the young players coming up now, their goal is to play on Broadway. And the problem with that is they, don't, they often don't listen to anything else besides Broadway-type music. So they're getting sort of watered-down versions of the styles. So their, their idea of jazz might be City of Angels or something like that. Their idea of rock might be Rent. They're not, they're not really learning the true styles of music. And I think that's really one of the most sure. important things is to, is to understand the style at its basic level. Like this is the real deal. This is what it is. 
So when my students come in and are trying to learn how to play commercial saxophone, they basically want me to tell them how to do it, explain it to them intellectually. And I always tell them the same thing, go listen. You have to listen and emulate. Nobody ever taught me how to get that kind of sound on the saxophone, ever. Right. I learned it by listening to Charlie Parker and John Coltrane and whoever else. Right. You, know, you learn how to get that sound. But again, like Dan said, you have to, you have to love it. Right. And I find that there's really not a lot of interest. That's sad uh, to hear, but it's, it's not um, unexpected, quite frankly, because uh, uh, I have sort of seen and experienced the same things as a player and also as a teacher. Uh, and I think, you, I think you hit a very important point that uh, because work has uh, downsized in the industry for every, everyone on every instrument in any style, but particularly for doublers, the last bastion of work that can give you an affordable uh, live, uh, lifestyle, especially here in New York, is the Broadway musical theater. And uh, I think you're right. If people are focusing on, on cast albums and Broadway shows as the answer to the style, uh, that's not going to get them to the core point, uh, especially when they get their own show and have to interpret music without mimicking someone else if they were subbing, for instance. Um, so with the reduction in recordings, the lack of studio work, certainly compared to the 50s, 60s, and to the 70s, uh, and the fact that there are a few big bands uh, to listen to as far as great saxophone playing uh, that tour the country, um, it, it is d more difficult on that level. However, we do have the use of YouTube. Right. And one can access all of the great big bands, all of the great soloists in any style of music today so easily. So uh, while certain things are more difficult than hearing live performances, certainly there's no excuse for not at least attempting to listen to things on YouTube and I find it would find it impossible to believe that anyone who loves playing the saxophone would not uh, be thrilled by listening to Charlie Parker or Coltrane or Dexter Gordon or Sonny Rollins or Michael Brecker you know Sanborn it would it, be impossible for me to believe that if you truly love playing the saxophone that you couldn't be inspired by yeah. one of those type of players mm -hmm. uh, and those are, we're just mentioning a half dozen or so. Um, well, and, and certainly research is a large part of it, but <clears throat> you have to go out and set up situations for yourself to play in, whether it be a quartet or you're playing duo with somebody or you're doing chamber music. These abilities aren't going to just come to you in the right. pit one day. You have to say, I did spend some time with chamber music at one point in my life, or I still do, or I'm, I'm going to get together and play some tunes with a piano player. You know, you have to push yourself and have these experiences playing with other musicians who are far better than you at that right. genre, and, and that's how you learn. You're right. gonna learn a lot faster on the spot with the horn in your mouth than with your nose in a book, or, you know, watching videos are great, but you're, you're not gonna get that on the spot training. Right, that's true. Yeah. And, and all of us have come through uh, conservatory training where we were we're primarily uh, studying Western European classical music at our conservatories on oboe or saxophone like you and I did um, with Joe Allard. Um, and yet we all loved uh, playing the saxophone in other styles as well. And in fact, the beautiful thing about certainly our good luck in studying with Joe Allard was that he encouraged that, uh, and as John Sedola did for you, to uh, go to other musics and play it and, and you know, uh, that's something that uh, I never thought would change in, in, the, in the saxophone world, certainly with doublers, but it does seem to have changed a little bit today, and I hope it's just a temporary trend and, and people will start trying to uh, uh, seek out the, the great heroes uh, uh, that have been established for the last 100 plus years on saxophone playing, uh, in American saxophone playing. Um, now, both of you studied oboe very seriously, but both of you have very different concepts of oboe playing. Uh, we could go into reed making, but that would take a couple of other videos to do that. And so it would put people to sleep. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're not going to go there. But um, uh, 
despite the fact that you both have slightly different approaches to reed making and, and to sounds you, 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 you uh, look for from your instrument, both of you have been immensely successful. And so I think that's an important point to mention that it, on any instrument, there's not just one sound uh, that will be successful, that if it's an artistic approach, that uh, it can work with different sounds. So there's, there's never just one approach. But could you uh, maybe talk, and maybe we'll do a little demonstration now of uh, a way you begin your oboe uh, practice and, and what you know, you're looking for. So uh, maybe we'll start Dan demonstrating uh, you know, a practice session routine that you might have or something that you think would be helpful to other oboe doublers uh, out there. Generally, when I'm thinking about picking up the oboe, first thing, um, I'm thinking about the way my chops feel from the evening before and what I need to do to get back on the right path. So generally, uh, the first thing that comes to mind for me is just uh, getting the chest open a little bit and some breathing. So, And again, this comes from uh, the Marcel Tabito warm-ups and uh, they're warm-ups that everyone knows that everyone's been doing for decades but I don't think most people know that it's all attributed to Marcel Tabito so uh, beginning with just simple breathing uh, he would use the numbers zero to nine inhaling and the same thing for exhaling so you know exhale first hold it in just a little bit release and then take a breath so a little bit what I was doing there I got a little ahead of myself was um, in his warm-ups he had a number system and you're probably both familiar with it but for the sake of our audience um, first, if we were doing a scale, first note would be, uh, we'd start from one to five, one, one, two, then as you're going to the next note, you're thinking two, three, three, and then the next note. So each note, you have a little bit of propulsion. <clears throat> so, uh, let's see if I can do this. And, uh, conversely, at the end of the phrase, four, four, three, 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 two, 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 one. So that's what I think of um, for warming up, but it's not just warming up the body, warming up the air. Of course, we're thinking about the wind speed and um, getting a, a nice ring right here. I'm also thinking about warming up, connecting the mind to the body, connecting the notes, and getting my phrasing warmed up. I'm warming up my phrasing, and, and through this process, uh, it tells me where my embouchure is at, if it's tired from last night playing too much jazz tenor saxophone, or if my air is not there, if I'm not making the intervals, um, it's going to tell me where my fingers are, if I'm not placing those notes in exactly the right spot that I want. So it's, it's a process of my body telling me where these notes need to be. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and uh, for the listeners out there, um, there is a CD out of Marcel Tabito teaching uh, many of his concepts. It's called Marcel Tabito Lessons, I believe, mm -hmm. and is available online. And for any wind player, this is a must. Uh, I was introduced to Marcel Tabito's numbering system at my very first lesson with Joe Allard in yeah. 1971. Wow. Uh, I was playing the Mozart concerto, clarinet concerto, and at the end of the first movement, there are uh, s s uh, several repeated uh, notes on the same note. and and Joe started writing these numbers down mm -hmm. I had no clue as to what he was talking <laughs> about uh, but uh, it was an early introduction to the nature of intensity of tone and uh, changing that intensity uh, from Scale one note of to color, the other you would, yes you would talk about and uh, speed of the air yeah and this and, is you know what's funny is yeah. it's always the first lesson 
<laughs> it was well, my first lesson at Eastman. Lesson, really? I didn't even know that it was tabby toe material. Wow. And then uh, the uh, Layla Storch book. Uh, right. Great. You expect to play the oboe if you can't peel a, a mushroom. An onion. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was an it's onion. It's an amazing <laughs> title. Uh, that, that lesson is in there. She, I mean, she kept meticulous notes, and that was every first lesson that right. Curtis is, is yeah. that one. And that is for every... Uh, woodwind instrument in Curtis that that because Tabby Toe really became the uh, teacher for the other great uh, wind players in the Philly Orchestra who were the major teachers in, um, uh, at Curtis we're talking about Daniel Bonad, mm -hmm. William Kincaid uh, and then so if you think about it we're all Saul already Schoenberg. playing the oboe <laughs> well, well, <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> the best parts of the album. <laughs> so, Rick, uh, what do you do in the Well, I, I was world? actually going to talk about um, something that, that uh, all doublers have a hard time with, coming from the saxophone to the oboe. And most of the time when you're playing the oboe on Broadway, you're also playing tenor saxophone. And the difference between the large tenor saxophone mouthpiece and this reed is pretty enormous. And so what I hear with, with the younger players especially is they tend to take too much reed in their mouth. And what happens is you get a sound something like this. Which nobody really wants to listen to. And one of the notes that I played, I played for a reason, that's third space C, which tends to be a very thin, bright note on the oboe. So my my concept is to try to even out the timbre of those instruments so that you go right through the break and you can't tell that you only have one finger down or something. So starting with B and playing chromatically. So that each note has a feeling of depth. So that all, it sounds like it's coming from the same instrument. Right, right. So there's a, there's a great little exercise to find the spot, to find how much reed goes in your mouth. And all you need to do is play third line B to third space C and try to get the timbre as close as possible and to try to get the pitch to really be a half step and not any more than that. So when you do it wrong, it sounds like this. And that C just sort of jumps out right. and it's more than a half step. Right. Right. So a little bit less reed. makes an enormous difference. It's just a very small adjustment there. So that's how you find the position for the middle register of the oboe. As you play lower, you come out more toward the tip. As you play higher, you go more in toward the string. It's just sort of a natural progression. But to find that middle register spot, that's such a great, simple exercise to do. And how interesting is that, that the parallels to clarinet, flute, and saxophone exactly. are the same thing. Exactly. Going in a clarinet, going from a throat tone to a, a third line B, right. to try to match them, or right. a, a flute or a saxophone from the third space C sharp to the fourth line D, right. and trying to make them sound as exactly a the uniform. Same. It, it's and, amazing. And the, on the clarinet, you can put fingers down to try to change the yes. resistance and right. the tone and the pitch, but on the oboe, you can't do that because you won't get the right the right pitches. So just by that simple exercise, you can find that position. So that would be a starting point. That would be the starting, starting point. point. That's the middle register, which, which goes from second space A up through G sharp above the staff. That's right. the middle register of the oboe. Right. And, the, and the other thing I find is um, that people often play too far out like this. Ah, mm -hmm. Like a jazz clarinet. Like a jazz clarinet. Or a soprano so saxophone, yeah. I tell them to, to try to pull in a little. I play a little more vertically than, than most people do. I don't advocate that, but you need to find, each player has to find that sweet spot where it sounds just right. So I'll just show you sort of the range using that C as an example. So it changes quite a bit wow. when you change the angle of the instrument. Part of it is, you know, the Joe Allard thing about covering the reed with your lip. I tend, to, because I came from that, I tend to play into my low lip my lower lip. So there's very little reed exposed in my mouth, but my lip is on the reed behind it. So it dampens the sound a little mm -hmm. bit and gives a little bit of a warmer sound. Interesting. Other people sound better out a little bit. So you really, it really depends on your musculature, right. the, your lips, thickness, your teeth. Right. 
things right. like that. And, and, and this, I guess, brings uh, yet another point to the forefront. Uh, how does the choice of your reeds and the angle that you play over influence your reed choices on your single reed instruments, on your clarinet and saxophones? Uh, how, how, on a working situation, uh, which is the reed that you're going to use as the, your, your axiom? Uh, I would, uh, my, my guess would be you would use your oboe reed and then go to your saxophone clarinet reed from there. Or, or is it another way around? I, I don't think of it that way. Uh -huh. I, I don't think about matching. People talk about matching resistances between yeah. instruments. I, I don't think that way. I think if you do that, you're compromising something somewhere. If the saxophone and clarinet have the same resistance, I think one of them or both of them are going to suffer. Just my, my personal opinion. And the oboe is a completely different animal. So I really try to get, get a read for each instrument that works to, to be able to get the sound I want. Now I think the compromise I do make is uh, I tend to put a little bit less clarinet and saxophone mouthpiece in my mouth than most people do because I want to get used to that feeling of being able to get back to the oboe read where I want to be because right. this is really my focus. I see. Okay. And Dan, do you, do you make uh, any compromises that way? I would say the only compromise that I take into consideration is, uh, like what we were talking about earlier, is, is the gig. What is, what is the gig asking you to do? Is there a lot of clarinet going on beforehand? Is there more oboe going on? So um, if it's going to be something, you know, uh, like West Side Story, something I keep coming back to, something that's really difficult in the... Uh, the balcony scene when they're singing tonight. You're on clarinet, switching to bass clarinet, back to clarinet, bass clarinet, back to clarinet. Then you, you come in cold on an English horn solo. Beautiful. So, <laughs> yeah, so you're, to have that flexibility, you're not going to want, you're not going to pick the clarinet reed that you really want to play. You know, you have to have something a little bit lighter, a little bit easier, just so that you're not beaten up for when you come in cold on that B flat on an English horn. So that's a big consideration that I, I make. Um, right. Also, uh, with the, the different scenes that we play in, they could be louder, softer, maybe it's a real beautiful chamber music thing, but a lot of uh, the contemporary shows that are going on right now are quite a bit louder. Uh, so there's some considerations that have to be made for being able to play a little bit louder or playing with a lot of electronic instruments. Um, those are considerations. Um, try not to go too far in one direction, but you know these are things that are in the back of your mind that like maybe this will make this performance a little bit easier or I'll right. be able to play a little bit more easily. Yeah. Interesting. Um, just jumping off topic for a second, uh, if you were to recommend to, a, let's say, a prospective uh, woodwind player who's considering um, perhaps uh, multiple woodwind performance uh, for a career direction, let's say someone is playing a clarinet or is a flutist in high school or an oboist or saxophonist, and they're thinking, hey, you know, I, I, this sounds interesting. I might want to try that. If you had your druthers, which of the woodwind instruments that you play would you recommend starting on? What would give? You, what do you think in, in the uh, parameter of instruments that you're playing would give you the greatest advantage uh, in starting on a particular woodwind instrument? Well, you know that's a really funny question because it uh, reminds me when I was studying um, saxophone with John Sedola, and he knew at the time I was taking very serious oboe lessons. He asked me one day, he said, uh, so do you play clarinet? No. Do you play flute? Yeah, I play some flute. But you're studying the oboe? Yes. He goes, Dan, you know there's two doubles ahead of the oboe, meaning that <laughs> the clarinet was far more important to him in his mind. Um, and he was an excellent clarinetist. And also the flute was in his mind ahead of the oboe double. Uh, but for me, doing exactly what I did worked out fine because um, I, I love the oboe and I wanted to learn that. I, in retrospect, picking up the clarinet a little bit later in life was more difficult. I wish I had started the clarinet earlier, like probably along with the saxophone uh, would have been a little bit more beneficial. Um, so I would say I'm, I'm very happy with 
starting with the elbow because it has taught me a lot just how difficult the elbow is. There's a lot of hurdles to get over and you realize that those hurdles aren't really, there aren't so many hurdles on the saxophone. Clarinet, there's a lot of hurdles. Flute, a whole different set of hurdles. But um, this this instrument has taught me a lot about the other instruments even before I knew about the other instruments. Right. So your you, the uh, oboe as the first instrument, prime instrument, would you be your your recommendation for a prospective oboe doubler? Yeah. Okay, Rick. What I, are your I I would say clarinet. Uh, to me, the clarinet is kind of the violin of the woodwind family. It's the thing that you end up playing the most. At least for me, even as an oboe player, I play more clarinet than than oboe. Uh, uh, on, no, uh, on, on the gigs. On, on the gigs. Yeah, the clarinet to me is. Is the is the go-to instrument for so many different situations, and I, I would have done that differently. I think if I had to do it again, and that's what I would recommend. Yeah. And I think the clarinet is the most difficult technically because of the overblowing of twelfth, um, and I just I think for me that would be my recommendation. Right, uh, not being a, a double reed player myself, uh, of the single reeds uh, I couldn't agree more for the single reeds. Um, uh, the clarinet, because of, of all the difficulties, it's cylindrical bore, right. overblows a twelfth, it misses every other overtone, and um, the open hole nature of it, uh, it's certainly compared to saxophone, demands much more exact right. fingering. And the fact that you can hear, if you're playing with too much pressure, you'll hear pops in the fingering on the clarinet because of the open hole. Uh, so I think it lends itself well uh, for the saxophone to follow and, uh, and also for the flute because, again, you're dealing with greater air compression uh, with the resistance of the reed. And I think ultimately, as I've been experiencing in recent years, um, it's helped me uh, get to the flute a little better than uh, I might normally uh, be able to do so. Mm -hmm. um, in wrapping this up, I wanted to talk a little bit about your heroes on the various instruments that you play. Uh, who, who are the musical heroes that, on your instruments that you look to? In other words, when you feel like maybe I'm out of shape or I'm coming back from a vacation where I didn't play, mm -hmm. uh, what are the records, recordings that you might access to sort of get you in gear, get you back into the flow of what you want your instruments to sound like? Um. Well, if we got into specific recordings, we, we'd probably be here a long time naming recordings and we'd have a lot of fun doing that. Uh, so maybe just going through players would be a yeah. little bit easier. And uh, I found that through my studies, going back to who was the first person, you know, who really made that huge impression on the scene. So like jazz saxophone, Coleman Hawkins, you know, the godfather of tenor saxophone. Um, <clears throat> Marcel Tabito for the oboe, um, Kincaid on flute, uh, Bonat on clarinet. Um, I mean, you know, there's I, I have a long list of heroes on every instrument, so it's it's kind of hard to just pick one, as I'm sure you guys uh, know. But sure. um, yeah, uh, I like going back to really early recordings because there's a musicianship quality, especially in early jazz in the 20s. When you see recordings of of people playing without any music stands on the stage, and they're just, you know, it's just it's it's magic, you know, and, and beating every quarter note with yeah, their foot. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and, um, and the intensity of of and the passion of classical soloists back then, it was you know the sound was just a little bit wilder, and just there's, I feel a little bit more passion. I I, I love early recordings and. and and learning about recording, and also Tabito was not a huge fan of being recorded. He hated his sound on recordings. So it's it's very interesting to learn w what that generation was understanding in their time, their music, and how we look at that. And I like to try and look back and find out, you know, whether it be a composer, what they were going through, maybe personally or financially, or where they were in the world, you know, how that contributed to their piece. Um, also, certain players where they grew up, where they came from, where they ended up, I think that contributes to the way they play. Um, certainly, you know, their musicianship speaks first, but um, there's a lot of other elements outside of music that contribute to the music. So um, 
Th those are the things that I like to try and find out. But usually the first people. <laughs> yeah. So it's, I mean, it sounds like you, you gravitate to the Philadelphia Orchestra, legendary players, uh, and, yeah, of and, and of course from that same period of time, uh, Coleman Hawkins. And, yeah. That, that, interesting. Uh, Rick, what about you? Where, uh, where I, do you go? I agree with everything Dan said, but I like to listen to some of the more modern players too because recording technology is so much better. Um, I'm. I've heard from people who have studied with Tabato and who heard him in person that the recordings don't begin to capture his sound because the technology back then was so much poorer than it is now. So we right. can't really get a sense of his sound. And I've always been very sound oriented, probably to my detriment. Um, but I agree with what Dan said about the musicality. But um, I thought I'd mention a few specific things the, to, to steer people toward um, on YouTube these days. There's a great interview with um, John Ferrillo, who's principal of the Boston Symphony, Oboe. Right, the former principal of the Met. The former principal of the Met. Right. He, there was a group called the All-Star Orchestra that did a series of right. uh, educational broadcasts. And there's a great interview with him where interspersed in the interview are clips of him playing in the orchestra, playing the most magnificently beautiful solos. He's an excellent player. I, I had worked with him a number of years ago when he was in New York. I knew him pretty well. Um, I would highly recommend people to watch that video. Um, also, there's a series of videos out by a man named Eugene Isotoff, who was principal in Chicago. Now I believe he's moving to San Francisco. And uh, there are videos of him explaining some orchestral excerpts and then demonstrating. And he's just a glorious player. So I, I really love listening to what's going on today, as well as the, the older players. Right. And uh, as a final uh, question to wrap up our session today, uh, what do you see as the future uh, for woodwind doubling, for <coughs> oboe doublers, and what advice would you give to younger players looking to make this a career uh, in an industry that is very competitive, uh, downsizing, and um, Difficult to break into. Um, what what advice would you give? Uh, you um, know, if you could give them one uh, one good bit of advice uh, in this direction. I, I would say just stick to your guns and to your love of, of music, and and <clears throat> you have to follow your heart. Uh, of course, the business is always changing. It, when we were kids, we were being told things ain't what they used to be. <laughs> it's true. Things are always going to change. Uh, the most important thing. I find for me is to be flexible, uh, be flexible uh, in my playing of different styles, be flexible with uh, different levels of musicians that you're playing with, um, be more flexible as a human being. Um, <clears throat> again, the will read changes every day and we have to adjust it. And, um, that's life. That is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So be flexible. Good advice, Rick. I would say, uh, especially in terms of the oboe, study with a top teacher. Um, like you said, Dan and I both studied with, with top people, and so many people who come to me, when I ask them who they studied with, it, it's someone I never heard of, and not only that, when I ask who did they study with, they have no idea. So I think a lot of people go about it in a little bit of a haphazard way, and they're not really, I think a lot of people go into it because they think there's more work, all I have to do is play the oboe and I'm going to be very busy. Well, that's not the case. Um, there, are, there are dozens of oboe doublers in New York and many more in Los Angeles. So you really, if you want to compete, you really have to do it right and do it well. Yeah, I, I would right. agree. I, I turn away students that want to study doubling. I said, have you studied the oboe privately at all with anyone? No. Well, that's what you need to do. And that's my first lesson to you. It was free. Right. Off you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, 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 all of these instruments are difficult. Nothing is easy, and learning music on a high level and, and diverse musical styles, I mean, this is a lifetime chore, uh, and I shouldn't use the word chore, it's a lifetime uh, of work, uh, but you have to, as you said earlier in the interview, you have to really love the instruments, you have to love music. You can't, it's not one or the other. If you're it's looking both. for a shortcut, you're gonna fail. Right, right. And, and the world of doubling today is very different from that uh, what it was in the 1950s or 60s, where there was so much work for woodwind doublers that people who were 
maybe good on one instrument and not so good on three or four others could have a very good career because there was just that much work. Today's scene is radically different and you have to be superb on every instrument and as you so uh, emphasized, flexible uh, to the point of being willing to learn, being willing to play different styles of music and going to a gig and maybe uh, not playing the first chair or not getting the solo but being uh, content with just the fact that you're going to be learning. Um, you know, one earlier interview I had uh, with Jerry Dodgen in, in the series, mm -hmm. uh, Jerry kept emphasizing all the incredible experiences he had were all learning experiences. He kept referring to them as learning experiences. And I think if one keeps that in mind, uh, you really can't go wrong. Yeah, you can learn something on a bad gig. Same Absolutely. Way, yeah. Just to wrap up the interview today, I just I wanted to make everyone aware of the fact that Dan is uh, the reed player at Kinky Boots, and uh, Rick is at a new show called The Legions, where he's the elbow doubler. So if you're in New York and get a chance to check out either of these shows, please come down to the pit and say hello to both of them. Uh, Dan also has uh, a new album out uh, called The Sati Project 2, which is available on Amazon and CD Baby through his website. Um, and we hope you'll also check that out. Uh, Dan and Rick, thanks again for dropping by today. And uh, we hope you got a lot out of this. Uh, we hope you'll come back uh, to joffeywoodwinds.com for uh, future interviews in the Woodwind Legacy Series. And check me out on Joffe Woodwinds on Facebook. Thanks. <laughs>